Hello again, everyone. Continuing on with Treasure Island, Part 2, Chapter 5. What I Heard in the Apple Barrel. No, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster, along with my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg, old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me, out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not, but he hanged like a dog and sun-dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Roberts' men, that was, and come of changing names to their ships, Royal Fortune and so on. Now, what a ship was christened? So let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old walrus, Flint's old ship, and I've seen a muck with the red blood, and fit to sink with gold. Ah, cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint, that's my story, and now here on my own account, in a manner of speaking. I laid by 900 safe from England, and 2,000 after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in the bank. Taint earning now, it's saving that does it. You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint's? Why, most of them on aboard here, and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some on them. Old Pew, as had lost his sight, and might have thought shame, spends 1,200 pounds in a year, like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that, shiver me timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. It ain't much use for fools. You may lay to it that nor nothing, cried Silver. But now you look here, you're young, you are. But you're as smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think, if I'd been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough, and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now, the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywhere by reason of suspicion. I'm 50, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentleman in earnest. Time enough too, says you, Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime, never denied myself a nothing heart desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days. But when at sea, and how did I begin? Before the mast, just like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places, answered his companion. It were, said the cook, it were when we weighed anchor, but my old missus has it all by now, and the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and rigging and the old girls off to meet me. I would tell you where, for I trust you, but it'd make jealousy among the mates. And can you trust your missus? asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook, usually trust a little among themselves, and right they are. You may lay to it. But I have a way with me. I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean. It won't be in the same world with old John. There was some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint. And Flint, his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well now, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man. And you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, 
Lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, uh, you may be sure of yourself, an old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you. But there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you are. And smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrel shook, and a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time, I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate. And the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point, I was soon to be relieved, for Silver, giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. Dick Square said Silver. Oh, I know Dick B. Square, retired, returned the voice of the coxswain, Israel Hands. He's no fool, is Dick. And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, he went on, here's what I want to know. How long are we a-going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough, by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor never was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. Leastways, your ears is luck big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word, and you may lay to that, my son. Well, I don't say no, do I, growled the coxswain. What I say is when, that's what I say. When, by the powers, cried Silver, well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a, he's a, here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all forecastle hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island as soon as the blunt's on board. And a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides, I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. <clears throat> Easy all, Long John, cried Israel. Who's a crossing of you? Why, how many tall ships, think ye now, have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver, and all for the same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I've seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would only lay your course and pint to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have your mouth full of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was kind of a chaplain, John, but there's others as could and steer as well as you said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, said Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he dry, died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they was a sweet crew, they was, only, where are they? But, I asked Dick, when we do lay him athwart, what are we to do with them, anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what would you think? Put them ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut them down like that much pork? That would have been Flint's or Billy Bones. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and short on it now. And if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ready. 
But mark you here, I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman. But this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote, death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin of coming home unlooked for, like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why let her rip? John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. Only one thing I claim. I claim, I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands, Dick, he added, breaking off. You just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of hands exclaimed, Oh, stow that. Don't you get sucking off that bilge, John. Let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence, Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news. For, besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will join. Hence, there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank. One to luck, another with a here's to old flint, and Silver himself saying in a kind of song, Here's to ourselves, and hold your huff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen, and was silvering the mizzen that top, and shining white on the luff of the foresail, and almost at the same time the voice of the lookout shouted, Land ho!